you. So my name is Colin Keir. I am from Vancouver, um, as someone else is too. <laughs> so uh, just like uh, two and a half million other people, we managed to survive the Olympics. Um, here's a little question. How many of you actually ever been to an Olympic event before? Raise your hand. And I can't see anymore. <laughs> just scream. No. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, back in uh, 2003, Vancouver hosted, uh, sorry, won the right to host the Olympics, and in 2010, we hosted the Winter Olympics. So, the topic is called Brilliance Exploits, the Vancouver 2010 Olympics. My whole goal with this, uh, with this topic is basically to discuss the social issues and the technological, um, I would say, maybe problems or observations that were made uh, by a bunch of us uh, here in Vancouver. So. There's no brilliance exploits involved in this event. Actually, it's a rather unfortunate title. Um, so the slogan for uh, the Olympics was with glowing hearts or deplete brilliant exploits. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I forgive my high school French. But basically, um, it's just an excerpt from the uh, Canadian National Anthem. And basically, that kind of goes into a little topic about copyright, which I'll explain a little bit later. And one little unfortunate item that came up during the Olympics when I was at a curling match was something called hack radio. Um, if any of you are familiar with curling, probably knows what the term hack means. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember now because I'm on this stage. So, <laughs> go figure. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring across five points. So, I'm going to talk about how the city becomes locked down, um, how the police interact with the people, and that sort of thing, and I'll probably use the, uh, the protests as a good example of what happened, but I'll also discuss other things that came up. And I'll also look at Olympic branding and copyright and how they all relate. Um, then I'll look at uh, t security in terms of um, ticket sales and so forth, so and they're kind of, it's kind of the same topic here. And then we're going to talk about, lastly, is how we tr thought we might have been able to get into the CCTV network and what we actually ended up finding out about it in the end. So without further ado, I'm going to go into the uh, first part of the topic, and that is the security. So if you take, to put, put this in perspective on how ridiculous security was at the 2010 Olympics, um, Salt Lake City, which was only a few months after 9-11, spent a total of $200 million, roughly around there, on just security. And that included, you know, things like having the military, I think it was like the, I guess you guys can't have the military, but I guess the uh, National Guard handling certain events, and of course, having your uh, police and so forth. In the case of the 2010 Olympics, um, the Canadian government, along with the provincial government, managed to spend almost a billion dollars on security. And I don't know where the money went to, because when I explain ticket sales, it's, it's kind of baffling. But as you can see here, you go to a typical event, and you'd have yourself uh, screened as if you were going to fly an airplane, because you apparently are going to be bringing knives into the stadium. This is, this is me waiting in line to go into a curling event. And so basically, yeah, it looked pretty much just like going into an airport, except there's no planes around there. And they also had open fields with Doppler radar. Now, I don't understand why they had Doppler radar in the middle of a curling rink when there's nothing going on inside that requires good weather. But as you can see here, it's on an open field. So my presumption is that they were using it somehow to keep to make sure that nobody's wandering in. I don't know Doppler radar enough to actually explain that. So. Somebody could potentially tell me that afterward. <laughs> and of course, they were very paranoid to think that people would bring boats into near the Olympic Village. They also had scuba divers swimming around the waters around the, uh, the Olympic sites. And just as general absurdity, they even had, um, actually go back here, I wish that was actually another order. There we go. They also had like, you know, a, I think this is a frigate here actually floating around Bar Inlet. Let, the thing that makes me weird or curious about this is why would you have a large ship trying to control people or terrorists. It's just one of those silly things. And of course you had police with, um, you know, SWAT teams roaming around and so forth. And to make this even more absurd, they brought in police officers from all over the country to handle um, security during the event. So they also had private security, but they also brought in outside police. And what was really silly about it was that they also brought corrections officers to actually handle some of the Olympic sites. Now, uh, knowing the police and how they know their rights and so forth, um, it's a little bit weird to have corrections officers who handle prisoners um, patrolling the streets. <laughs> so it's one of those silly things that I observed as I was uh, wandering around. And of course, um, there was this whole level of paranoia prior to the Olympics where 
Um, this is where the transit police uh, brought out these uh, ads. You know, if you see people taking pictures of uh, cameras, that you should call the police. Now, I don't know what sort of thing that some terrorist, quote unquote, would actually do with a picture of a, uh, of a camera, but you know, what do I know? I'm not a police officer. So with all this, all this security paranoia from the police and the government, um, there was this worryment that was going around that, you know, rights were going to be circumvented. And as you can see in this photo here, here's one of the Olympic mascots. Um, I can't remember his name. I think it's Sumi. I can't remember. Whatever. There's a whole bunch of mascots. I'll bring up something a little bit later about them. Um, basically, from everything you could see here, a lot of rights are being trampled. There were lots of laws introduced, such as um, the Homelessness Initiative Act, which basically, if you're found homeless on the streets, the police could pick you up and force you to go into a shelter or even supposedly jail. And it was actually really serious because um, up until then, the homeless were kind of not so much, but really left alone. But as the Olympics drew closer, um, a lot of these things became, uh, became prevalent and some sort of quote unquote issue all of a sudden. So we had that. And there was another initiative that came out, whereas if you were to have a sign on your own property that would basically be something anti-Olympic um, anti or something that didn't really jive with the IOC or the Vancouver Olympic Committee or VANOC, excuse me, um, you could be either arrested or you could be char arrested and put in jail for up to three months or even still uh, be char fined something like a couple thousand dollars just for having a sign on your lawn. Now, there, the law didn't really, um, sorry, the, the, the provincial government allowed the, uh, the Vancouver Council to actually amend the bylaw to actually allow, sorry, amend their constitution, their city charter, excuse me, to permit the sea sort of rules. But as far as I know, it was never actually um, enacted, fortunately. But, you know, things like this were passing, and this is sort of um, the whole kind of nature that was going on here. So you have to excuse me here. There's no water on the stage here. No, oh, I got one here. Sorry. Sorry, I'm not used to the humidity in this city, so I've been kind of uh, tired. <laughs> so. As you can see, here's a little poster from uh, one of the anti-Olympic groups uh, that we put out. Um, you can see here the attitude from the, um, the people against this sort of action was pretty appear. And Take Back your, your, Our City was actually one of the events that was organized and uh, was actually supposed to coincide with the opening ceremonies. So you can see here the uh, three main Olympic mascots were there and they all got together and actually protested. Now. So about 3,000 to 5,000 people converged not too far from where the Olympics are. If you look in the back towards the left, there was actually the uh, Paralympic countdown and the other side was the Olympic countdown. So this, they actually put this clock up here and it was always a constant target for uh, people to actually deface. And now it just reads zero, 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 and just constant zeros and doing nothing. But yeah, basically they had, we had a, there was a ton of people that organized uh, actually outside of what's known as the Vancouver Art Gallery and it's actually common to actually organize protests there. So. One of the things that the BC Civil Liberties Association did because they were fearful of what the police were going to do is they brought in these uh, legal observers. And the objective that these people had was effectively to ensure that the uh, rights and privileges that you have with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms were, were kept in line. Police were keeping, keeping themselves in line. And while there was a lot of controversy between the protesters and BCCLA afterward, um, overall from, uh, from this protest, nothing major actually happened. And you can see here, people are marching towards uh, BC Place Stadium, which is where the Olympic ceremonies were held. And of course, they eventually met with the police. Now, these are mostly RCMP and Vancouver police officers. And to, even though it kind of looks like they're pushing on uh, the protesters there, from everything I've read from the front lines, nothing actually happened. The police were cordial, and the, uh, the protesters never really got out of line, per se. Um, this goes in uh, stark contrast to the G8, G20 protests, whereas if you were five meters away from them, you would be arrested. So big difference there, and it's kind of silly. And of course, you can see they were not that far away from the actual stadium. Let's go skip uh, to the next day, where 200 people decided to march uh, downtown. And if, you ever, if you're Canadian, you're familiar with uh, the term black bloc. I don't know if it's either the term used in the United States, but these black rock protesters uh, basically were in involved in this here and they were made um, deemed, basically demonized later by the media. 
And, you know, they all protested through the city and so forth by throwing uh, newspaper boxes and mailboxes across the street. Really, mu not, not much more than being a nuisance more than anything. But then it turned to, actually, skip here. Um, then it turned to uh, crap, excuse me, here, by throwing stuff in the windows. This is the worst thing that happened, really. This was, there was nothing worse than this. There was some glass broken and some stuff spray painted. Um, the worst, you know, this was, uh, this was the Bay, one of the largest companies uh, sponsoring the Olympics within the country itself. And all they did was smash windows. So that was the worst thing. So where did the billion dollars of security actually go to, you'll have to wonder. Well, well, I'll take a look at that in a second here. So after the glass was smashed, the police came in and um, donned the riot gear. And you can see here the, uh, the protesters are back and oh, back and away at this point. Brought out their, uh, their machine gun. Sorry, is that a semi-automatic? Does anyone know what that gun is? OK. So you can see here, they brought out the heavy artillery at this point. They're probably shooting rubber bullets, I hope. Um, they did a, they basically, the protest got really deep into what's known as the West End. It's mostly residential, but it was also the site of the Olympic Family Hotel, which is in the background, as you can see here. And the police were more concerned about just keeping it away from there. Um, this one person's, of course, getting arrested. Out of all the 200 people, I think um, only a couple dozen, if that, got arrested. And it might even be less than that, from what I remember. Uh, I like this photo most because uh, he's wearing uh, Canada boxers. So <laughs> I, I don't know why I like that photo a lot, so I, but I did. And as they videotaped um, everyone else, everyone else took photos of them. So I figure it's tit for tat. Now, this is, how many of you are hockey fans? How many of you are Rangers fans? <laughs> Okay, so about 16 years ago, there was a certain team from a certain city that I might have mentioned earlier playing against a certain team from a certain city that plays in a stadium that may or may not be across the street from here. <laughs> and <laughs> it went all the way to Game 7, and that certain team that I was very fond of at a very young age um, lost. It was sad. And, of course, uh, one little thing happened in that city that I'm talking about. A riot. <laughs> about, the numbers are always varied in what happened here, but about anywhere between 10 and 60,000 people converged on downtown Vancouver. They're, most of them were drunk after getting the Game 7. And the largest riot in Vancouver's history after whatever that uh, other riot I can't remember off the top of my head basically erupted, tear gas everywhere. If you ever go on YouTube, just do search for uh, Vancouver 1994 Stanley Cup riots and you'll see how bad of a situation it is. Let's skip to the Olympics. How many people were downtown for the games to watch them? Well, there was, on average, it was estimated anywhere between 100 to 200,000 people or anywhere in a downtown core at any given time during the two-week event. And, you know, everyone's being, sorry, I'll skip ahead. Everyone's being all patriotic and happy. And the one thing that was kind of, I kind of feared and kind of expected or to happen was that Canada and the United States went up in a gold medal hockey game. And they did on Canadian soil. So the, I, the worry meant that I thought that, sorry, the worry meant that I had was that we would have a repeat of 94 if we lost. Now, I don't know if we won if the same thing would have happened either, but it didn't. But in the end, Van sorry, the, the Canadian team did win over the Americans in overtime, fortunately. But, <laughs> not to rub in your guys' faces or anything, but I'm just saying. But basically, that was, my main, that was my main thought about what was ignored by the media in terms of what the security costs were going towards. And it was actually going to, towards to prevent things like um, the 1994 Stanley Cup riots from, you know, rearing their ugly heads again. And a lot of things actually were done prior to doing that. So they actually stopped liquor sales past 10 p.m. and so forth, or past 6 p.m., excuse me. Uh, just to prevent the consumption of liquor in the open, because it's actually illegal, just like most um, of North America, to drink liquor in the open, unless you're in Nevada or Mexico, I guess. So that was the main concern. But I don't know, see, how a billion dollars was needed to stop that when really there's, it just really seems absurd. So that gives you an idea of what the, the climate was like in terms of the uh, policing and so forth. And I'm going to go back to the security element in a, a little bit later, actually, here, when I talk about how uh, tickets were handled and passes for staff were handled. So we're going to talk about advertising and Olympic branding. So 
The IOC is very, very protective about their brand. Now, case in point, there is a pizza place or a Greek place, I can't remember where it, uh, what, it's, which, what it serves, called Olympia in the western end of Vancou uh, the downtown Vancouver core. And they actually have the Olympic rings actually on their logo. Now, other companies have had their Olympic rings actually stored in the logo as well. And the IOC has managed to force anyone who misuses the brand, the Olympic rings brand, to remove it from their signs. So an international organization has been going to any host country, for that matter, to actually have these, uh, slo these logos removed. But you, the main reason for that is not because they're just, they want to make sure that the sanctity of the Olympic rings are kept, because we all know how figure skating works. <laughs> it more or less has to do with how much money these companies put into um, Olympic advertising, and it's a lot. Um, as you can see here, this is one of uh, the towers in, down, in the downtown core, and Samsung put their crappy uh, Omnia phone actually on the tower. Now, this is not the only ad that was on a tower. There's like banner ads thrown on top of, uh, like, scattered all over the bay, which is the uh, department store downtown. Uh, pretty much any, any, Vable, um, any Vable advertising space was used. And you can see here, companies that want to broadcast the games pay a lot of money too, and they actually in turn have to show the Olympic rings for like, you know, during the year that they're actually broadcasting the Olympics. And in this case here, they actually don the Olympic rings right on the outside of the, um, outside of the, uh, the broad, sorry, the station itself. And of course, every, as I was saying earlier, every single um, advertisement space is bought. I could not even leave the transit system, doesn't matter how far away it is from the Olympics, um, without running across one of all the transit signs or all the transit ads being replaced with Olympic ads. So you can see here is a visa ad on a uh, bus, uh, bus stop there. But it doesn't mean that you can't advertise relating to the Olympics. Now, it's kind of weird how it works out, but in order to not get in trouble with the IOC or Vanoc, you actually weren't allowed to advertise anything with 2010 Olympics or Vancouver, and I think winter was also part of it as well, so you couldn't make any mention of any of those four words if you're going to advertise anything that could be misconstrued as a part of the Olympics. So if you're going to sell flags, or you're going to sell sporting gear, or you're going to sell things like anything that, in general, that could somehow come back to be an Olympic thing, you could not put those words in there. So in this case here, Nike just decided to allow people to submit um, phrases to actually put on this uh, projected wall here, which is not too far from uh, where the bay was. This is actually on top, next on the Sears downtown. And you could just basically submit a message and it would be shown on the, the uh, projector, as you can see here. Or you could be really creative and actually sell products um, that actually are, are sort of semi-branded as uh, being Olympic, but they're not. So in this case here, uh, Lululemon uh, Athletica basically decided to sell all these uh, clothes that were colored in the uh, colors of uh, participating Olympic teams. So you can see here is Sweden, and this woman here is donning uh, a painted black tooth, which for some reason is supposed to be attractive. <laughs> and, <laughs> and basically, you know, all they would have is like Sweden, Canada, the United States, and their colors on there. But they didn't make mention of any of those words. So nothing about winter, Vancouver 2010, or the Olympics. Lululemon, I kept this on the market for about, I think it was, I, I might be wrong, but I think it was no more than a week. And there was a lot of heat generated towards them, and eventually they buckled down after spending all this money, and wasted all this, you know, all, these, uh, all this material making this uh, Olympic gear, or sorry, quote unquote Olympic gear. And, you know, they stopped selling it after all this pressure from the IOC. So you could try and get away with it, but so usually, you know, the IOC in Vanock will, or sorry, in the Olympic Committee for that particular country will actually clamp down hard on you. Because, like, say later on, if Lulu Emmett decided they wanted to be the official Olympic supplier for, I don't know, 2016 or whatever Olympics are coming up, it, they may not be able to do it because they screwed around and won the Olympics. So Stephen Colbert, if you ever can go back to an episode, made a good point about this. Um, I actually got to see him live, so it was actually pretty hilarious. But this bit here was pretty straightforward. Um, if you ever watched this bit, he, all he was doing is talking about, what can I do if I'm going to talk about the Olympics? And he goes through this whole process explaining that he can't use the Olympic rings, he can't make any reference to the Olympic rings, he can't change the shape of the Olympic rings. And in this case here, he can't have the colors donning the Olympic, uh, sorry, the Olympic colors in some sort of flat line going on two rows. So it, it's, really, it's really silly in terms of how the copyright works out, but this is 
what he did. So he ended up coming up with like what quadrennial um, cold weather um, athletic competition or something like that is when he would refer to it as. And it was just, <laughs> it, it, mind you, it wasn't really winter. It was more spring actually during the Olympics this year. But it, it, it's just to give you an idea of the absurdity of the uh, whole copyright aspect of the Olympics. And Stephen Colbert was pretty bang on about it. And it's kind of sad, though, because with the Olympics um, comes a lot of problems. Like in this case here, when they do come to town, they do get rid of anything graffiti-like. And this was not graffiti-like. This was actually an art project. Um, the city of Vancouver actually tried to get rid of this art project and eventually backed down on it. But um, all it was was just um, something that had been up for quite a while. But they thought it was graffiti because it was painted on a, uh, you know, a card, sorry, a plywood board over a window. But really, it was actually put there as an art piece. Um, this, they actually did win on one thing. Uh, apparently one night um, somebody plastered blue paint all over an existing mural. It was a nice mural with that. And then of course of all the controversy that came out, they put a new sign up that says new mural coming soon. And then that has been like that since then. So it's kind of awful. But <laughs> try as he must to protect the Olympic, uh, Olympic <laughs> try to protect the Olympic brand. Um, it doesn't always work. So. Pedo Bear apparently became a part of the Olympic brand. <laughs> and I, I, and what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you here, this is quite true. They, he did become a part of the Olympic brand inadvertently because he was featured in a Polish newspaper. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how this came to be exactly, but my assumption, like everyone else, um, is pretty much they went on Google Image Search, did. Vancouver 2010 mascots, and that came up, and <laughs> said, "Sure." Mind you, they hated us later on. When was it? Was it no, it was actually Serbian, I think, actually that had that accident. But some Eastern European country had that poor guy who actually crashed. But nonetheless, um, yeah, jokes, jokes on us. So I'm going to talk about tickets here. Um, tickets for the Olympics were, uh, how can I put it? This is where my question about where this $1 billion in security went, because I actually thought that these tickets were insecure. They were, there was nothing redeeming about them in terms of security. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen um, the 25C3 talk on barcodes before, but I'm probably going to tell you um, everything you learn about barcodes there applies to the Olympics in Vancouver. So these were your typical tickets you would get, minus the data. Here's your actually standard set right here. Um, that's it. You can actually, there's nothing, there's no real security on it. There's no water prints, the, uh, sorry, no um, water, yeah, sorry, water marks, excuse me. And the only thing that authenticates, quote unquote, that it's an official Olympic ticket is the um, little hologram on the bottom right there. Or you can end up buying one of these tickets here, which is, don't let me, the hologram is there, which is what I ended up buying that actually has. Nothing. You can see here, this is a standard scan ticket. There's no watermarks. This is pretty much an exact photocopy of the tickets that I bought. Except for the hologram there, which doesn't copy over. But I'm going to explain in a moment here why that hologram was stupid. And there's the back. Nothing on the back there. Or you can have an Olympic pass. Once again, has no security except for a little perforation that goes down the bottom that anyone with a uh, needle and a bit of time could replicate. Uh, my friend was nice enough to actually scan his in. You can see here, no security, no security, no security. So how do you copy a pass? Well, thanks to high definition television, it's not that hard. You can pretty much just watch TV <laughs> and <laughs> wait for the pass to come along. <laughs> and you can become a part of the uh, Olympic speed skating team in this case here. Um, Really, it is that easy. I remember a couple instances watching a couple of matches, and you would just see this pass. And you, in one case, I was able to read the text on the bottom. But if you go back, you know, all you have to do is just, you know, come up with some bullshit name like, you know, clean, cleaner cleaning services, which was real, or you could just say like janitor or something like that. And all that mattered was that it looked real. Now, you're probably going to be wondering, well, what do you do about the um, little hologram there? Well, that's where it kind of got silly. And I'll actually talk about this in a sec here. Actually, I'll bring this up here because somebody did actually manage to duplicate a pass. Now, this is not, this is from my understanding not the pass, but this is the pass that supposedly the media was told about, which was somebody printed a pass from Yahoo Canada that said all access and managed to get within 10 meters of uh, Vice President Joe Biden. 
There was somebody who surprisingly is a huge fan enough of Joe Biden that the, he had to meet him. <laughs> and <laughs> he came in within 10 meters after getting through all the security checks. So this is really our billion dollars in security in action. And, you know, got 10 meters away from them. I don't know what 10 meters is in yards. It's probably what, 30 yards? So that's fair. That's pretty. Okay, so 10 yards, 10 meters, you know, that's ballpark right there. So he got pretty freaking close to, to your guys as vice president. And so all he used was supposedly a pass like this. But the thing is, though, not, secrets don't stay secrets for a while. And a lot of the people who worked in BC Place uh, when the opening ceremonies were going on and when this incident happened, um, all they heard was that, no, it wasn't that pass. It was actually a copied um, staff pass that had a barcode stolen from a visa card. So that pretty much answered my question when I heard about this. Did they actually care about the barcode? Which really, the only time they cared about the barcode is when he entered into the Olympic Stadium, or sorry, into an Olympic event. Now, I'm going to go back and explain why those tickets were stupid in the first place in a moment here. But even if you didn't grab the, uh, bar sorry, the uh, hologram from the uh, Royal Bank uh, Visa card here, you could just as well go buy something from, the Olympic, from anywhere that sells Olympic <laughs> merchandise and just you know, little blow dryer, pull off the sticker off the label that came with your Quachi there. So this is where it comes down to, can you copy a pass? And the answer is yes, you could have done that. There was no RFID. So we, that was the first thing that we thought of when we uh, decided to actually play around with these tickets. The barcodes really don't have anything security because there's security and barcodes are, don't go in what, hand in hand. And there was no real watermarks on them either. So I'll go back there for a sec. So, what was the other problem with the tickets? Well, I'm going to talk about the ticket sale system. Now, <clears throat> I don't have any slides for it, but in BC, it is actually, and most of Canada, it's illegal to scalp tickets. But there's a way you get around it. You get a license to sell tickets, resell tickets. Now, in the past, um, the Vancouver Canucks tried to lock down ticket scalping, and all they ever, all they ever accomplished was everyone got themselves licensed. So prior to that, everyone was hanging around the street selling their hockey tickets for you know three hundred, four hundred dollars, you know, instead of seventy bucks, what they paid for the tickets. So when they try to crack down, everyone said, "Oh, screw it! We'll just legitimize ourselves, and we'll just get a license to sell these tickets." And now there's multiple companies in Vancouver that actually sell tickets, uh, resell tickets after they've been bought. So Vanock, knowing that this would be a problem, and I'm surprised they didn't try to get a law passed for it, but decided that they would create their own ticket sales system. So if you bought a ticket for you know, um, this curling or hockey or something like that, and say you couldn't uh, make it, well, you could just go and sell your ticket through the Vanock accredited uh, ticket sales site. Now, the problem with that is that you would, is this. You would sell a ticket. But if you were one of those people who went and got those fancy tickets, which I showed a little bit earlier, which had a little nice little art on and so forth, you actually got to keep that ticket, even if you sell um, the ticket online. Because then we just go to the ticket vendor and actually uh, just buy, get a ticket printed out. It was a souvenir for you. Now, the problem with that is that you could just go and resell that ticket too. <laughs> So you would make money off the first ticket. So whoever was nice, you went and bought the ticket, you know, Vanock would take, you know, 15% or wherever the hell they charged. And you, that person would be able to go to the game for whatever they paid for. But then you'd still have that physical ticket. So you could either A, go scalp it on the outside and risk getting arrested, or B, you can just go on Craigslist and just go sell your tickets that way. And this actually happened to several people. They actually went and bought these tickets through Craigslist and found that they were deactivated because somebody had already sold the tickets prior to. So yeah, you can make twice as much money back on those tickets just because Van Ock didn't think this whole system through. And if you wanted to, and going back to the whole um, Olympic, um, you know, pretending to be Olympic staff, it's actually not that hard. If you can see here, this um, water, ocean blue kind of jacket and the red gloves were actually readily available at pretty much any, um, any of uh, the bay. Or Zeller's um, shopping department, sorry, department store. So, if you had that pass and you had the jacket and you had those gloves, which everyone in the country seemed to have during that time, um, you probably could have just gone away with it. I don't know about the lanyard, but the jacket definitely. So the last part here, I'm actually surprised I'm actually going much faster. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so the last part of this is all about the CCTV camera network. And this pretty much this had a lot of us in Vancouver who were interested in security and privacy um, pretty bothered. Um, this one kind of amusing. Um, CTV was the official broadcaster of the Olympics, and I actually happen to like this logo that somebody found there. But 
throughout um, Vancouver, they had several cameras um, set up, basically just to watch every move that every person visiting the games made. And a, uh, excuse me here, I'm gonna skip ahead here. You can see another camera here. Actually, I'll go back. So, an entire security camera system was set up throughout all of, all of uh, through all, through all, all the sites in Vancouver. Now, there was something like, um, how many people did I say there was? Sorry, so in, in, normally there's about 900 to 1,200 cameras in the downtown core. On t when, the ca when the Olympics came in, they added an extra 2,000 cameras um, just to all the Olympic events. And that's not, that's quite a number when you think about the size and the space that they all take. And the system was adopted was uh, something called Omnicast, which was from a Quebec firm called uh, Genet sorry, Janetech, which is a really stupid name. And this is the sort of diagram that they gave out with it. So it's a pretty simple IP camera system. Um, but it's rather interesting because it can actually be integrated with something called AutoView, which is some sort of license plate reader, or a uh, Synergist, which is an IP another IP-based system which allows you to do elevator control, access control, that sort of thing. So it was like one whole integrated system. So uh, when I first heard of this system and started reading into it, I kind of wondered if this was going to be a permanent thing because if they took these cameras and integrated it with the AutoView system, then of course they can keep track of your movements through uh, license plates and so forth. So it was kind of interesting in that respect that they were adopting this system. But and as you can see here, this is the whole map that was actually, those were the cameras prior to the Olympics. So that's, I'm not sure why that slide was in there in that order, excuse me. But this is the thing that kind of got us interested. So we figured out it was, you know, your standard camera setup, you know, MPEG-4, um, H.264, that sort of thing. And it was, you know, had IP and analog camera support. And that was okay, you know, it was your standard IP camera. But then we came across the transmission methods and discovered, oh, it could be doing it over wireless. So we got really excited over this. We're thinking here, okay, great, you know, these guys are really stupid. How could you implement a system that, you know, permits, you know, wireless cameras, right? And, you know, we decided, okay, three, three of us from, uh, the, three of us decided that we were going to go ahead and do this. We were just going to go and see if we can snip out these cameras, right? Because if they're wireless, then theoretically we could view them, right? So we decided to go for a walk. So we walked from one point of the uh, downtown core to what is known as Canby Street Bridge, which actually basically covered um, where the hockey games were ha have held, and then where the uh, Russian um, Russian pavilion was, and along where the uh, the Olympic villages. So the Olympic village is on the left side of the screen, as you can see along this little route here, and. You know, we probably should have thought this through before we did this, but when you're in a highly densified area, you know, trying to track down wireless networks is, um, a specific wireless network is, is a pain in the ass. Uh, when we actually finished the job, when we walked from there to there, we found out there was about almost a gig of data. And, you know, it was painfully hard to sort through it. Now, I gotta backtrack a little bit here, and, or sorry, just back up a little bit here. And before I say anything here, I can't mention what we found when we walked through it because how Canadian uh, radio laws work, and I'm not a lawyer, so I might be saying, uh, getting this understanding wrong, is we can listen in, but we can't tell you the contents of what we found as we walked along. So I can't tell you what we saw, what we saw happening along the route or anything like that. But what I can tell you is we didn't find anything. Now, <laughs> which is kind of sad, but I can tell you we didn't find anything. So as you can see here, these were the areas we targeted. And as you can see here, the little uh, red area down there was actually closed a couple days um, shortly after we uh, had done that little job there. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of um, what the sort of area we were working with and what was happening. But, you know, we took for a walk and warned us that the seawall is about to close. I think it was a few days after um, New Year, so most of us had recovered from uh, heavy drinking in the few days before and were willing to do this walk. We went and took a look at the cameras, you know, their standard you know, wrote, you know, your standard fixed cameras and your standard uh, dynamic uh, movement cameras. And then we, you know, saw the little boxes there. And if you look towards the bottom, the little yellow thing there, if I'm not mistaken, is actually um, a power outlet. So, you know, we probably, we, we were kind of dismayed, you know, the power is probably not running to them. You know, there's, we can't do anything with this. There's nothing broadcasting. You know, we did see the lines being run all over the place. We didn't know if they were uh, Ethernet or if they are fiber or what. So. We were rather disappointed to find out. We did find out, though, that this little unit on the top is actually a giant IR light emitter. We were trying to figure out, you know, we 
thought it might have been some sort of radar system that cut on bandwidth because they're using wireless, but in the end we figured it was actually um, some sort of uh, giant IR flashlight, so to speak. But one of the guys, uh, we, we, sorry, one of us actually took a walk to work one morning and found them setting up a camera. And lo and behold, it was actually Ethernet. So basically all they did to run this whole network was just make one giant um, Ethernet network. It was just nothing special about it. And yeah, there was that was, we tried again to the CCTV network or at least get an understanding of it. In the end, it turned out to be nothing fancy, which is kind of disappointing. But yeah, um, pretty much that's uh, my whole little uh, overview of it. I hope that from this talk here that it kind of inspires people when they're in London or they're in um, Sochi. I doubt there's anyone here from Sochi here and who would be willing to risk that. Or if you're in Rio, um, you know, I highly encourage you to just take a look at the systems that they've imp implemented or even ask if they've actually implemented their systems properly and not in half ass like they have during the Olympics. So you would think for a billion dollars they would have done a better job. But yeah, um, and also thanks to everyone who's helped me. I had some people from uh, certain organizations help out. Uh, Chris Shaw, for instance, uh, he was uh, pretty, pretty vocal about being anti-Olympic. I'm not anti-Olympic, I'm not pro-Olympic, just so you guys know. But yeah, I just hope that uh, this kind of leads out with some sort of inspiration. So thank you. Do we want to ask a question? Okay. So uh, I just came from Canada too. I was in Toronto, so I got to experience the whole G20 thing full force. And uh, a lot of the things you mentioned, it, it struck a parallel with me because Toronto did it, but to the next level. Mm -hmm. We spent $10 billion on security. 10? I think that was the number. No, one. One. Because I was about to say, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm mixing it up now. But um, right, I was wondering if you, you've heard much about Brian Son and uh, his arrest because he was doing similar things in terms of mapping out the camera networks and. Are you talking pictures. about the guy, that CISP guy or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know much about him actually, to be honest with you. But when I found out that he was a CISP and then somebody um, being a dick actually went and got his CISP um, suspended. Right. I wasn't very impressed over that, but I don't know much about him to say anything, but okay. I do have to say I'm rather impressed that uh, Toronto spent a billion dollars in three days, and we spent a billion dollars over three weeks scattered over two months, so <laughs> I, I guess Toronto's all about spending more. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> is, is Mitt? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm actually from Richmond, B.C., and cool. I was, yeah, I was uh, there for the entire Olympics, even to the run-up. I was born and raised there. And like throughout, right after 2003 to when 2010 hit, there was just all this pandemonium in the media. And it was really the media more than it was the people. Like mm -hmm. my friends and family did not give a shit. Like I really did not know anyone who was afraid of Al-Qaeda or any or terrorist organization coming into BC and starting stuff up. I can't say that for everyone, but the people I knew generally. But there was like a great pandemonium in the media uh, decrying, oh God, we're not ready, we're not ready. And I've personally talked to like an RCMP officer and he said, yeah, I'm really scared about the Olympics and like it went off without a hitch. I just, where do you feel that fear and anxiety came from, from the government um, that, you know, there might have been something really large coming through because I did not see it. I didn't really understand where that was coming from from our politicians and it really didn't make sense to me. I think the whole attitude really comes down to um, what's going on in this country, for instance, and I think it kind of reflects upon what most of the Western governments are doing these days, which is, you know, this whole, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And realistically, in the end, um, I think a lot of people have become conditioned to the idea that they should conquer down and they shouldn't like, put their heads in the sands and just pray that nothing bad goes on and let you know, other companies who sell these security products to run amok and, you know, keep us from dying. But honestly, you know, the worst things ever happened during the Olympics is, actually, no, the worst things ever happened during the Olympics is what happened in Atlanta 96, which is where a um, pipe bomb went off. Munich? Munich, yeah, is, the Munich was, yeah, and that was before that, that's correct, because they had the, uh, the Israelis that were kidnapped, if I'm not mistaken. Am I correct with Munich? Yeah. So, but I really think that most of the Olympic security paranoia has gotten worse since 96, but I think with 9-11 um, and all these other things that have come along, the governments have decided, well, it's in our best interest just to go, that, go to the extreme, even though it's unnecessary. Yeah, just one more quick question. Yeah. Do you think it should have 
been handled the same way if it was done all over again? Do you think, like, you would have done it the same way? You know, it's funny. Um, I, I, I think it would be because it's um, like if you look at Sochi, a lot of people think Sochi's unprepared, and there's a good chance it could come back to Vancouver. Um, if it were to come back to Vancouver or come back to North America, which it might, actually, I would expect it to. Um, I would think that same level of paranoia would come back. Whether or not they'll spend uh, as much money or if they'll spend more, uh, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Looks like you're getting all the Canadians asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first fellow mentioned the, the, the G20 and the G8 in Toronto recently, and the point's been made that a similar cost for security was spent on both that and the Olympics, but at least in the case of Vancouver, they got the uh, potential economic benefits of being on the Today Show, being on the Stephen Colbert mm -hmm. and that. So I wonder if, if you could give us your thoughts on that. And also, with regard to the, uh, the black bloc tactics that mm -hmm. you mentioned, that happened on the first day in Vancouver, and of course we saw in Toronto police cars being torched. But prior to the Olympics, the head of Olympic security was asked if uh, he would rule out the, the possibility of the, using the agent provocateur yep. tactic. And Mr. he said he would, Mercer, yeah. he would not rule that out. <laughs> and, and it seems that we always see these, these people in black hoods, and we never find out who they are, but in the media it's reported that protesters torched police cars. And it's kind of, it reminds me of when you know, some, some company allows uh, you know, their security to be breached. It's reported as hackers you know, penetrate a security when they don't know who penetrated their security. Mm -hmm. so, I just sort of wondered about your thoughts on that as well with regard to the, the black bloc uh, tactics. Well, the black bloc tactics, uh, speaking, I, uh, speaking as a former history major, I don't really find their tactics as really weird. Um, I, it's not unusual to see this sort of thing. Whether or not I agree with them, it's, it's kind of a you know, give or take sort of situation. I don't know how to address it really, uh, give you a for a proper answer without going into a I'm just tribe. wondering if you feel that that was in fact people that were, were oh, protesting or if it was possibly... I, I'm going to go 50-50 on that. Yeah. Like I think it's very likely you did actually have that sort of element, but at the same time I can't give you that answer either, right? So. And what about contrasting Vancouver's uh, security expenses? Oh, I would, I, I would say that it was better value for the money. Yeah. Even I don't know whether or not the Olympics have, will spin off anything good for the city, but whether or not the it was better to spend it in Vancouver over Toronto, I'd say Vancouver definitely. At least, there's, uh, at least it was for the people and not for you know, 40 random old guys who I don't give a damn about. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if, um, if the, the Vancouver city environment was, was restored to its initial state. Were, were all the cameras taken down? Were all of the security mechanisms taken down? Or? Well, fortunately, all the walls disappeared, so that was a good thing. But with regards to the cameras, um, the Vancouver police wanted to, wanted to keep them, and they were really you know, pushing for it. Um, fortunately, this current city council seems to have some sort of semblance of intelligence, even though it's kind of debatable. Um, and they just voted against, uh, they voted to keep the cameras but not keep them um, fixed. So basically what they meant is they have the cameras still but they're not in place and they only bring them out apparently when there's special events going on. I kind of take that view as in the, the they want to just keep it around and eventually reconsider implementing them because there's always been that talk about putting cameras in the downtown core anyway. And it's a common topic that comes across the whole country to begin with. So. I, I'm hoping that the cameras stay, is go away and they don't come back, but like they could re uh, rear their ugly head again, so. Hi. Um, hey. I heard that there was a lot of trouble with the weather uh, <laughs> in the Olympics, and I was wondering, was there any interesting technology deployed to... Dump trucks. This? Yeah, just dump, dump trucks. Dump trucks of snow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. So they said, they, they weren't lying when they said it was going to be the greenest Olympics, because um, there was plenty of green grass everywhere. If you saw in that first photo of, uh, when I was going through the curling, uh, to go to curling, oh, that green field there, that was our, uh, that was the first ever Spring Olympics. Um, now, they, to bring in, what they did was they had a snow event. They actually canceled all these people from standing to actually watch the games because there was just mud and snow all over the place. But what they did is they brought snow from a place called Manning Park, which is about 200, 300 kilometers away from uh, Vancouver itself, and brought them all the way into the city, uh, into the, uh, into one of the mountains north of the city, just so people could ski on them. So, yeah, they were the greenest Olympics ever, weather, but they had a hell of a carbon footprint. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, there's nothing else. Uh, thank you very much.